is by thinking a bit about Bitcoin and about the claims of its advocates, because these claims are, in a couple of important respects, uh, wrong. The first important claim that the advocates of Bitcoin make is that it's the world's first virtual money. And um, when they make that claim, they're thinking of uh, what I would call the conventional history of money, which is the way that most of us are brought up to think about uh, how, what money is and how it came into being. And that conventional story, um, I'll summarize it briefly, goes something like this. In the beginning, there was no money. I mean, back in primitive times, you know, there was no such thing. Um, there was just barter. In other words, you know, I produced, as it were, fish, and you produced corn, and if we wanted to exchange things, then uh, I would give you some fish and you would give me some corn. And, of course, this is very inefficient because you have to want exactly what I've got and I have to want exactly what you've got, and we have to want them both at the same time. It's what we call a double coincidence of wants in economics. But nevertheless, this was the only way of doing things in those primitive ages. And then, sooner or later, some clever person thought of an idea. Why don't we choose one thing um, which nobody would want you know, for itself, uh, but you'd want it because it could be exchanged for other things. That thing would be a so-called medium of exchange. And in principle, that could be absolutely anything. And indeed, you know, if you look back over monetary history, all kinds of funny things have been used as money, uh, salt in Abyssinia, and fish, in fact, fish itself, and <coughs> you know, used as money. But usually, of course, uh, it was precious metals, you know, because they have very desirable properties. They're malleable, uh, they're portable, uh, you have a small amount of them, which is valuable, and so on. And by stamping things on them, you can make sure they can't be counterfeited, and so on. And that was the invention of money, basically. That, that was it. And then there's another stage, which is that um, a bit later than that, uh, someone came up with another good idea, which was, you know, we could lend and borrow this money stuff, this medium of exchange. Um, that was the invention of credit. And even later again, institutions grew up which specialised in this uh, borrowing and lending of this medium of exchange, and so specialised in building these superstructures of credit on top of this money stuff. And that was the invention of banks. Um, and it, this is a very plausible story of the bank, not a perfect example, I grant you. And it, it's a very plausible story, and it's a story that you find throughout the conventional literature on the history of money. It's in Smith, and it's in Locke, and so on. It's in all the sort of usual economics textbooks you'll find. And I even found the other day, it's in a very authoritative source indeed, uh, with my young daughter, How Things Began, famous husband. Here it is, story of money there, as you can see. Starts with barter, choose anything you like to be the medium of exchange. Sooner or later, someone comes up with coinage because it's got the best properties. And then over there on the right hand side is banking. You know, people take it to goldsmiths and so on and so forth. But there's a problem with this story. And the problem is that real historians, not economists like me, but real historians and uh, anthropologists and so on, have always known that this is historically inaccurate. It's not true that this is how money evolved. And it's not the experience when we've been to so-called primitive societies and seen uh, them that that's how money uh, is in use there. Um, and it's not logically true either. It doesn't reflect actually what money is and how it works in the real world. And to explain a bit about why, I want to take a detour. Um, it's a big detour to this place, Yap. It's an island in the, in the Caroline uh, Islands in the Pacific. And this is an island which was pretty much untouched by uh, civilization outside of Micronesia until the earliest 20th century. Um, when in 1903, it was visited by an American anthropologist, um, a young chap called William Henry Furness III. Uh, and he'd made some previous expeditions to Borneo, and he went to Yap. He wanted to see what it was like, investigate the culture and society and so on. And he expected this would be a very primitive place. It's a tiny little island. You can walk across it in a day. Uh, it's only got three commodities to speak of. Uh, there's fish, there's coconuts, and there's beche de mer, sea cucumber. That's the, the luxury. And he was expecting to find a very sort of simple society. And in fact, he found, as, as anthropologists often do, quite a complex society. It had 
uh, fishing and fighting fraternities. It had uh, you know, very elaborate mythology, um, and it had a, had a slave class and an elite class, even though it was a tiny little island. But the most remarkable thing of all about this island of Yap was its monetary system. I mean, you would have thought that with only three commodities, surely barter would suffice in this place. Maybe not even barter, maybe not even net. But no, it had quite a complex monetary system, and it was impossible not to notice this monetary system because its coinage consisted of these enormous limestone disks like this, which were in fact quarried on an island quite a long way away from Yap and then brought to Yap one by one. And Furness, the anthropologist, you know, he was very puzzled by this. Uh, you know, he, he was brought up in this conventional way of thinking about money, and it didn't really fit in. I mean, as a medium of exchange, enormous limestone disks are about the last thing you would choose. Um, in fact, you know, as one often does, he tried to adapt his thinking to this. He thought that maybe it was because they were not portable that they'd been chosen as a medium of exchange. He said, you know, when it takes five strong men to steal the price of a pig, then burglary cannot but be disheartening. But then he noticed that, you know, these things were never really moved around. They weren't much exchanged anyway. In fact, what happened was that the people of Yap would go about their business and trade with one another. And in the course of that trade, they would accumulate credits and debts. And then they would just offset these against one another. And occasionally, at the end of a month or at the end of a few months, uh, if the need was felt and there was an outstanding balance, um, this could be liquidated by actually transferring one of these stones. But in general, they didn't move at all. And in fact, he heard this story from his local guide about one particularly large and valuable version of these stones which had fallen overboard in transit from the island where it had been quarried. And despite the fact that it had been lying for several generations on the sea floor, its value nevertheless accrued to the family that owned it. And nobody questioned the wealth of this family, and they'd been able to use it and spend it for years and years and years. So here's this funny story about this picturesque place and its strange monetary system. Um, and you may think, well, you know, it's good for color in histories of money, but not much else. Um, and I think that's the way it would have stayed had the book that Furness not written come to the attention of the editors of the Economic Journal, the leading uh, economics uh, academic journal of the day in 1910, and they passed it on to a young Cambridge Don who had been uh, seconded by the time they passed it on, it was a couple of years later, to the Treasury on war duty, and that Cambridge Don was this fellow, John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes was astonished when he read um, this account. Um, and he said this, I won't read it out, you can read it up there. He was enormously impressed by this. Why was he so impressed by these people? It was because he felt that these people of Yap had a remarkably clear understanding of the nature of money. They understood that the tokens that we use, which could be coins, they could be checks, they could be, as they are today, simply bits that appear on computer screens telling us how much money we've got in our bank account and so on. These things are not money. It's what they represent which is money. And what they represent is a system of credit and clearing that enables us to transact with one another. Money, in other words, is really a set of ideas. And this is something which the people of Yap saw much more clearly than the Western Europeans or the Americans of Keynes's day who were fixated on the idea that gold, for example, was money. 